it. Today, we're going to look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 33. These are the words of Jesus. He says, No one lights a lamp, then hides it in a drawer. It's put on a lampstand so that those entering the room have light to see where they're going. Your eye is a lamp, lighting your whole body. If you live wide-eyed in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a musty cellar. Keep your eyes open, your lamp burning, so you don't get musty and murky. Keep your life as well lighted as your best lighted room. We just got back from our family vacation. It had been a little more than a year since we had gotten out of town as a family. And my best favorite part of the vacation is probably something that most of you might be surprised because I was surprised. It was a nice moment of tension in the car ride with the kids arguing and fussing and my wife and I starting, the tension starting to rise. We were taking a break for the day from Disneyland and heading back to our Airbnb. And there was just this like, something was welling up inside of me. Like we were at Disneyland, yet I have three griping children in the back seat. And so I start kind of mentioning it to my wife and she's like, you gotta chill. I'm like, no, we can't chill. We're at Disneyland. Like they gotta be grateful and excited. And this is amazing. And this costs so much money, you know? And so we start kind of going back and forth and we pull into the parking lot and we stop for a minute. And I think Rachel and I just both felt like God was telling us to have a conversation with our kids. So I stopped and I turned around. I said, hey, guys, can you just listen for a minute? And we had probably a 20-minute conversation with them about how blessed they were as young children and how not everyone gets the opportunities that they're getting right now. And you could sense a little bit of curiosity, like, why is dad talking to us right now? And you could, you could sense like the almost diffusion of tension between my wife and I because the conversation led to this uh, idea we enacted throughout the rest of our trip that I want to introduce to you that I think we can enact in our church community throughout the rest of the year. We came up with this, we said it was a code word for the kids, but we came up with this concept at the end of this conversation was, anytime we feel like you're griping or un ungrateful, or maybe you're just missing what's happening around you, mom and dad are just gonna point something out to you that's amazing. We might say something like, look at that, wow. And, and at first, my oldest kid just kind of rolled his eyes at me like, oh, wow, whatever, dad, like, why are you doing this? But the longer we did it throughout the duration of our time at Disneyland, I started to recognize they were doing it on their own. Look at that. Wow. Look at this. Wow. And, and my youngest child, she's only five. She didn't have to be taught that. Like we're in line for one of the rides and, and Tom Holland pops up to explain the Spider-Man ride. Now the graphics were amazing. I know they're not real, but the way they project his image and as he's talking and moving, you could as a five-year-old look at it and go, wow, Spider-Man is right there. Like she was amazed that Spider-Man in the movies works at Disneyland. Like he's, he's right there. Like this, he's really there. We took the Millennium Falcon ride and she's driving and she turns around and she goes, dad, are we really flying? Like, is this real? I'm like, if you want it to be sure. Like every other thing we did, she's like, is this real? And is that real? And, and, and she just be like in this awe and this amazement and this sense of wonder was coming over her constantly throughout the entirety of our trip. And I saw it in my oldest child at Legoland. Uh, he loves Legos. He's building Legos since he was little. And, and he's doing a project like that every weekend. And we get to Legoland and they have cities, like all of like New York City and San Francisco and, and the Paris, like Eiffel Tower in Paris. And we're taking this boat ride and we're looking at these buildings. And when you look at them on the internet, it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. They made a Lego building. But they're like so intricate and ornate. And you can see cars and window washers on the buildings and things are moving and the detail and the attention to detail. And then the tour guide is telling us these corny jokes the whole time. But then she's telling us how many millions of Legos each building. Well, this town took 200 million Legos, and this one took 25 years, and this, and so as it's happening, I could see his, like, wonder begin to kind of unravel and unfold, like, whoa, this is so much bigger than any Lego I have ever built. How much of that wonder, I wondered, is childlike? Like how much of that is just inside of us because we're young and the world is huge and grand and mysterious 
and, and maybe confusing at times. Like how much of that sense of wonder is inside of us as children, and when does it leave? Like, when does the magic kind of fade away and you start seeing the things behind the scenes at Disneyland? One of my favorite memes that one of my friends sent me this week was Mickey Ma- uh, Minnie Mouse with, with her head peeled up, you know, the, 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 the big helmet thing they wear, and it was an old man smoking a cigarette, you know? And he's like, this is Disneyland, bro. And I'm like, geez, bro, why you got to put it like that? You're ruining the whole, like, the whole experience here. But I started to wonder, how often in my life do I chalk up my lack of amazement or wonder or sense of awe to just, oh, I'm a realist, or I've just lived a little more life, or I know what's really behind that curtain. Did I outgrow it? Did I choose to outgrow it? Is it, like Jesus is saying here, a position we take with the way we see the world? Listen to this passage again with that sense of wonder in mind. He says, no one lights a lamp and hides it in a drawer. It's put on a lampstand so those entering the room would have light to see where they're going. Your eye is a lamp, lighting your whole body. If you live wide-eyed in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is musty cellar. Keep your eyes open, your lamp burning, so that you don't get musty and you don't get murky. Studies at universities have shown us that this sense of wonder can be scientifically broken down. They have found that they can study depending on people's environments, how they react. They did this study in Yosemite National Park with the giant mountains and the beautiful views and this vast valley. And they would ask people, hey, would you just draw a self-portrait? So they had people, okay, cool little stick figure, self-portrait. And they would ask the same type of question to people at Pacific Wharf. They would, they would ask them in, this, in San Francisco where there's shops and, and amusement park rides and, and restaurants and hundreds and hundreds of people all around them and the beach and the music and the loud. And they asked them, hey, would you do us a favor and just draw us a quick self-portrait? And what they realized was that depending on the environment and what kind of wonder was inside, it, inside of those people was the size of their self-portraits that 90 plus percent of the people who drew themselves in Yosemite National Park drew themselves smaller than the people who did it in that wild environment where it was just entertainment and grabbing their attention. That a sense of wonder and awestruckness made them feel and then draw themselves smaller. Like it, it gave them an understanding of the world around them to such a degree that they were less important especially outside of an environment where everyone is telling you it's all about you. These same studies, uh, they did scans on the brain, and they realized that uh, certain parts of our nervous system would engage throughout our entire body during moments of awestruck wonder. They'd show them these images of space or mountains or, or, or whatever it was, some type of a phenomenon, and people would be wowed and amazed, and they would watch their brains light up, and it wouldn't just affect their brains, it would affect their stomach and their digestive system. It would lower their heart rate. We've all been in that moment where um, the, the vagus nerve, it, which goes from the back of our neck through our heart and through our lungs and through our body engages, right? Where your, the hair on your arm stands up. That's a, that's a physical response to an emotion that we've invoked. It's something our whole body goes, whoa. You ever had that moment where you're like, whoa. Maybe you're watching a movie, like, especially the way that we do scores of, of, of music with the scene and the slow motion or the explosion, and you're like, whoa. I'm sitting in Legoland. We're watching one of those 3D, 4D films, and they're blowing wind in my face and shooting ocean water, and it was awful, and I hated it. And, but we're wearing these glasses, and every time this like, character had this, I forgot what he had, a scroll or something, during the story, it looked like it was about to hit you. It come, and I, I looked around this theater full of kids, and they're reaching out in the air to like, grab it. And, and I'm like, it's not real, guys. You know what I mean? Like, but, but they're just like, they're, they're just awestruck. And then simultaneously throughout the theater, throughout this short film, you could hear the response from all the children and even the adults. Like, without even us like, planning it, it would just, you just hear, whoa, like the whole crowd whoa, and then the wind would blow, and everyone, whoa, that is an innate response built into the way God biologically designed us, that when we see something we can't wrap our minds around, our entire body engages. 
Now it's the same part of our bodies that engage during fight or flight. It's the same reason when something scares you or makes you nervous or sets you off, that that same thing happens in your gut and the hair on your arm stands up and you get a little nervous. It's the same part of our system that engages. One researcher put it this way. Uh, He says this, even the ego-related regions of our brain, together referred to as default mode network, are deactivated during moments of awe or wonder. That, that little piece inside of you, that voice in your head that tells you you're all important and your opinion matters most or you're right and they're wrong, literally shuts off in a moment where your body is engaged in awe or wonder. And then I look at the world we live in and the arguments and the divisiveness and the stress and the political tension and the racial tension and the socioeconomic situation we found ourselves in as a country and especially within the church. And I'm wondering, all of those things happen because we all have enormous egos. What if our problem is that we lack in moments of wonder? That we lack in moments of awe that we actually remove ourselves from moments like Disneyland puts us in, where for just a second we might believe in in magic, or that we're flying, or this is way too big to wrap our minds around. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus puts it this way again, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes in wide-eyed wonder and belief, your body fills up with life. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. We have an all-time level in our country of anxiety and depression. One in ten adolescents have considered suicide. I wonder if we've pulled the blinds down on wonder. Like, if we just pull the blinds down on the big, giant, unexplainable things, the the beauty and the majesty of of nature or space or science or, or even just moments where we're surprised. Like, to be surprised is rare. We're so wide-eyed and open, uh, uh, closed-minded that everything is not real and that must be fake and that's just not true. And, and so we start switching our language to start saying things like, hey, I believe in facts, you know, and, and I want to make sure that, that we're, we're getting the facts straight and the news stories break and, and we don't even believe it at first. You know, we want to make sure we get all the facts. And so what happens is we want to explain everything. Everything is understandable. Hey, if we get all the facts right, we get this story straight, we get all the perspectives together, we can make sense of this. I saw a news story this week about uh, some kids fighting in Florida. Did you guys see that? They're fighting in a mall in Florida. Somebody pulls out fireworks, and they're fighting with, like, Roman candles in the mall. And so it invoked this huge police response, hundreds and hundreds of police officers, because it's in a public mall, and they're hearing these giant noises. And, and, uh, and so people are filming, how, what kind of police response is this? Just for a couple of kids fighting, something must be underneath. Something subversive must be taking place. And the conspiracy theories, one guy was like, there were aliens, and the police came and killed the aliens, and they're just covering it all up. And one person, oh, it's a terrorist attack, and they just don't want us to know about it. And what happens is our intrinsic, deep desire to understand and to pull the wool off of our eyes leads us to trying to over-explain everything, and so we're believing in all of these different theories, and it leads us, especially Christian people in the church in America, to start believing in conspiracies because that makes sense. That, that's plausible. That's reasonable. That makes way more sense than a bunch of fireworks and four kids getting arrested, and it lets our minds run rampant because we don't want to enter into a world that's unexplored, whereas the other end, wonder... And awe and amazement open us up to a world that's unexplored, a world of imagination, a world of things that we cannot explain. It invites you and I into a place where we can potentially be surprised and hopefully be surprised by God, surprised by hope or healing. The same word that that we translate in the Greek from wonder and amazement, it's the same attached word that we use for miracle, unexplainable phenomena. 
something that we can't wrap our minds around, something that doesn't make sense, but that we're seeing with our own eyes. You and I need to, this year, move beyond our need to understand everything. Some things, like the nature of God himself, cannot and should not attempt to be explained. That's the frustration we have, right? Try to explain to like your friend like who Jesus is or the concept of God or the Bible. And what do we try to do? We get as rational as possible in our arguments. Well, the Bible was this, and oh, well, the original was that, and oh, well, church history shows us this, and, and we're trying to like logic them into the kingdom of God. That never works. Why? Because God's kingdom is not logical. It's not of this world. It's not a concept we're meant to grasp and understand completely. We will never have all the facts until the end of time. And so we keep coming to these conclusions of culture and our country and theology and who God is, and then there's the danger, who God isn't. And so then we can include or exclude all the people around us. God is like this, and he's not like that, and you're like that, so therefore God is not with you. And it's our ability to filter out who belongs and who doesn't. Paul told the church in Corinth in the famous love chapter, he wraps up that love chapter with this passage. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth. And what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like any infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright, and we'll see it all then, see it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly, just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us towards that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of these three is love. Here's what I'm getting. I am to give God the same place in my heart and in my mind and in the way I live my life as he holds in the universe. I'm going to give him that in my heart. He's amazing. He's expansive. He's uncontainable. He is immutable. He is all-powerful. He is everywhere all the time. He sees and knows all things. He was from before the beginning. He will be here after the end. I cannot wrap my mind around this God. And that's where he sits on the throne of the universe, this ginormous, magnificent, magnanimous being. He needs to be that inside of me. But I don't do that. The God that most of us serve at most points in our stressful lives is a God we get. It's a Jesus we get. It's something we can sum up and, and bottle up because that makes sense. Let me relieve you of the stress of following Jesus in our culture today by saying this. You will never fully get God until you meet him face to face. You will never fully explain him until you meet him face to face. All the systematic theology, all of the logic, all of the schools we have filled, all of the books we have filled about God barely are the tip of the iceberg of who he is. We barely get God. And what God wanted us to meet and see, he embodied in Jesus. We can get that. We can see that. We can do as he did and think as he thought. We can love extravagantly, hope unswervingly, and trust steadily in the Father. Matthew Henry put it this way, we cannot, by searching, find the bottom. We must sit down at the brink and adore the depth. We cannot find the bottom. I'm sitting by the jacuzzi at our little Airbnb, and it has this like rim around the edge where you can sit, and my 
my five-year-old who cannot swim, was just walking around the edge of it, and I'm sitting there on my phone, and I had my feet in the water. I was dressed not for swimming whatsoever. And all of a sudden, I hear a splash and some gurgles. <gasps> I just hear it. I'm like, oh my gosh, she went in. So I turn over, and I'm like, I'm dressed. I like these clothes, you know? So I'm like, you got this? And nope, she doesn't. So I go in, and I grab her, and Rachel comes around the corner, and she's like, I thought you weren't getting in. I was like, I, I wasn't, you know? I was like, don't tell your mom, you know? Like, I was supposed to be in charge of you. But you could see the kids, right? They're in the pool and they know what the deep end is. Why? Because in the deep end, you, you can't touch the bottom. And here we are in our feeble Christianity, trying to follow Jesus in a world that does not. And we're constantly looking for the edges. How far can I go? How far is too far? Where are the boundaries? What am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to say? What does God believe? Where does God stand on this issue? And we're over here trying to find the bottom of the pool. Friend, you're not tall enough nor strong enough to wade in those waters. God is grand and he is huge and he is massive. And we will never fully comprehend him until the end of days. And what if all of our energies that we expense in trying to explain away God to the world around us, what if those were reprioritized and redirected to wonder? What if like us and our kids at Disneyland, anytime I saw somebody getting fussy or angsty or impatient or unhappy, I just pointed out something cool. Wow, look, there's Goofy, wow. And they'd be like, wow, oh yeah, wow, this is amazing. What if we did that as a church? Like, what if when we came together and we shared our meals or had our coffee before and after these gatherings or in our small groups, what if instead of like, hey, could you guys pray for me? You know, my kids have just been such a pain this last week. What if it was like, wow, you have three healthy children? That's amazing. Not everybody gets that. What if it's like, well, you know, I really wish we could do this. Like, well, wow, look at what we are doing. Look at who is around us. Like, wow, I'm married and she hasn't left me yet? That's amazing. Like, Wow. I want to look at my, at my day-to-day, not just the big picture, because that's so easy. The big picture, oh, I could do that. Okay, sure, Pastor, great message. No, my day. I want to wake up in wonder every single day. What does that do? It makes me smaller, just like the people in Yosemite drawing their self-portraits. I become smaller. It reminds me of John the Baptist. They're trying to inflate his ego. John, well, you're amazing. The way you speak, man, like you're baptizing all these people. They're flocking to you. John, are you, could he, could you be the Messiah? And what is his response? He says, I, I baptize you with water. But the one who's coming is going to baptize you with fire, which by the way, Jesus didn't baptize anybody in actual fire. Then he says something like this. He must increase and I must decrease. I don't think he's getting at all of us thinking so less of ourselves that we pity ourselves. I think he's trying to put us in actual perspective. Yes, you are good. You're a good man, a good woman, a good mom, a good dad, a good business owner, a good student, whatever it is. You're good at that. And you're gifted. And you're made in God's image. And you're special. But in comparison to the creator of the universe, you are itty bitty. And that should humble us. Humble us to the point of being like John the Baptist. Yeah, I'm doing all these things. But I do all these things to reflect his image and to make his name greater. And all of a sudden, all of my problems and all of my stresses and all the things that keep me tossing and turning or up at night seem to fade away in comparison to how huge and amazing God is. That was like one of the first Sunday school songs we learned when I was growing up in the 90s. Our God is an awesome God. We had, the, we had the hand signs and everything. I don't know what they are. This is like TikTok or something. But, but like we had, the, we had the, the motions. I thought it was real sign language growing up. It's not. We made those things up. <laughs> but the concept was I need to teach these kids at a young age, God is awesome. And that word has lost most of its meaning. It's, it's lost it. Awe does another thing for us. It fosters community and selflessness. One study did this, they were in, um, they put people in different situations, just random strangers walking on the street. And they would take someone who was holding like a small box or basket of, of pens and pencils. And depending on where they were, they had different responses. 
So someone would be walking, walking along, and they'd be near the Eiffel Tower, people taking pictures, people in amazement looking up at this giant tower and where they are in, in, in France, and this is awesome and amazing, and this awestruckness was all about them in this environment. And somebody would be walking along, and they would just drop all their pens and pencils. And what they saw was that in everyday situations like malls or places of, of consuming or places that didn't have as much wonder, less people helped them than in those places. By a vast majority of people in awestruck environments would stop and be like, oh, let me, let me help you. And they would pick up on average 90% more pencils and pens than anybody else who might just pick one up and here you go and keep walking. It's the same thing that happens around us. You ever notice that? When we're in awesome environments or we're amazed by something or surprised by something, how generous we get. You can ask my bank account. I was at Disneyland this last week. It was nuts. I was like, this is amazing. This is, you want a churro? Here you go, baby. Like, it doesn't matter. Money didn't exist. Whatever you wanted, you got. We're in Disneyland. Why? It's amazing and it's awestruck. How do I know that that really happened? Because I went to Legoland three days later and everything felt painful to dish out and hand away. It wasn't as cool. It wasn't as amazing. I wasn't as awestruck. It wasn't as magical. But when environments that happen where I'm awestruck, I become more generous and more selfless. And I start looking around to the world around me and helping other people. But all of that is a decision I make. Do I walk into a space like this or into home at the end of the day or into a meeting with a friend or colleague? Do I walk into to the family's house at Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter with my eyes squinting in distrust? Or do I walk in wide-eyed and wonder? Wow, you look amazing. Wow, I can't believe I get to see you. Wow, this is, this is so cool. Look at this. I'm so glad the kids are all here. And watch what happens in the spirit of generosity when you walk into everyday situations looking like that. Our empathy increases the more open our eyes are. I think when I choose and you choose a life filled with wonder, and it is a choice, I think it will open our eyes to see work that God is doing already that we haven't been positioned to see. Just sit with that thought for a second. When I choose to go about my day with my eyes wide open, looking to be surprised, to be amazed, to be in awe, I'm positioned to see the cool and amazing things God's already doing around me that I may never have seen had I chosen to walk around squinty-eyed and distrusting. Maybe you feel like distant from God or I just don't feel like God's working or he's not moving. or I feel like I'm just repeating the same prayers over and over again. And, and you wake up and you're squinty-eyed and you're distrusting. I don't know. It's another day. It's another day at the office. It's another day with the kids. It's another day of stress. The bills came around again. Oh, here we go. More problems. And you walk into your day like that. You are not positioned, friend, to see the good things God is doing. Try it tomorrow morning. Decide in your heart to have a position of wide-eyed open-eyed wonder, to look for all the amazing things around you, to stop and proverbially smell the roses and watch what happens. You'll start noticing things about other people, start noticing things about yourself, start noticing things about the world around you. You'll see God's hand in places you didn't even know God was working and moving because you just chose to open your eyes. Second Peter, he writes this, don't lose a minute in building on what you've already been given, complementing your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love, each dimension fitting into and developing the others. Do you catch that? All of these are like a constellation. They work and point to each other that when you add them, you see more of all of them. With these qualities active and growing in your lives, no grass will grow under your feet, no day will pass without its reward as you mature in your experience of our Master Jesus. Without these qualities, you can't see what's right before you, oblivious that your old sinful life has been wiped off the books. If I choose to live this way, 
I'm going to see all the things God has already done in me. And I'm going to position myself to what Peter says is maturity. N.T. Wright put it this way, you become like what you worship. When you gaze in awe, admiration, and wonder at something or someone, you begin to take on something of the character of the object of your worship. It doesn't matter. We become the context in which we choose to live. When I choose to be in the context of awe and wonder of who God is and how gracious he is and how good he is, I will become more like him. It's like, what do they say? You are what you eat. You are who you hang around. Show me your five friends. and I'll show you where you'll be in five years. That same concept applies to the way I look at God. Is he as big and grand and beautiful as scripture describes in my heart? Or is that still conceptual to us? To the way we view what is ours, what's mine, what I've worked for, what I've built, when I compare it to the wonders of who God is. Because at that point, any explanation or any description of God becomes worthless. <laughs> it's nothing. It's simply a reduction, an oversimplification, a, a try to bottle it up and sell it, $3 worth of God, so that hopefully you can take it. But let's break that bottle open. Like this year, this is my prayer for our community. We're going to go through the book of Colossians and Philemon together. And it's about how big Jesus is. It's about how everything is wrapped around him at the center of the universe and God's kingdom and the world and history and humanity. But my prayer for us as a community with all these new babies coming out everywhere and, and all of this like potential in our community for what could happen this year is that we don't go in squinty eyed like we'll see what God does this year at Annex Church. Like we'll see what he does in my family or my relationships or if he, if he heals my body, let's just go in wide-eyed. Like, let's be surprised. I'd rather be the wide-eyed wonder kids, the wide-eyed people like just think everything is amazing and every like Legoland, their, their slogan is everything is awesome. And, and I want to go in every day like that. Like, I just want to go in every day just going like, this could be amazing. This could be a potentially amazing day. We could, we could break records. We can make strides. We could have healing. We could see our families come back to you. I just want to go in and instead of going in, everything skeptical with my, my arms folded and my eyes squinting and my heart usually potentially closed up. I, I, want, to, I want to go in open-minded, open-handed, with wide eyes just going, let's see what God could do today. Like, let's just... Just potentially, let's give it a shot. Like, we might be the weird kids at the end of the year, but let's just try it. Like, let's just give it a, let's just give it a, let's give it a go this year. Like, just be the weird kids that are like, wow, that's amazing. This is so good. This food is delicious. You're like, bro, it's mac and cheese. It's the best mac and cheese I've ever had. It's so good. We started our church 10 years ago. And uh, I remember we walked in, I don't even remember what space it was anymore. To be honest, my mind has fallen off the back of my head in the last 10 years, but we walked into this room, and uh, we were potentially going to rent this space, and it was, it was Pastor Josh. And I was, like, skeptical. I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. Where are we going to put the kids? Like, what's it going to work? And, and I turn around, and he's got this grin from, like, ear to ear. And he goes, have you seen this place? Do you see, do you see all this? This is amazing. And I was like, I'm standing in the room, bro. Yes, I see it. Like, but he was just like, this is perfect. This is, could be awesome. And, and, and I want to adopt that kind of mindset. I thought he was so weird. I was like, well, of course. Like, what are you talking about? I remember our first Easter. We had Easter and we had all these thousands of people show up to the Cibola uh, football field for an Easter egg hunt. And I was like, we had planned it. We'd spent way too much money on it. We hired police and we had like, like porta potties. And we had a hot air balloon dropping eggs out of the sky. It was nuts. We'll never do it again, I promise. And, and as it was happening, these people were flocking. And I was stressed. Like we had like volunteers. And we got to pull all this off. And all these logistics were happening. And it was early in the morning. And I'm like freaking out. And I'm like, okay, here they come. Okay, oh man, people, let's make sure we get these groups and set up. And Josh goes, you see all these people? This is amazing. And I'm like, shut up, Josh. <laughs> like just... Stress with me. Look at the situation, like, objectively here. No, he just was like, this is so cool. Look at all these people. Our first baptism, he's like, wow, look who we're baptizing people. And, and, and as, I, as I've matured, like Peter talks about, I've become more, wow, this is so cool. This is so great. I thought he was weird, and maybe he is a little weird. But I think, I think we could be the weird kids this year. 
Be the weird guy at work who looks at the bright side of everything, who tries, who tries to do something just to see. Just Maybe we'll be surprised. Maybe this will work out. Be the hopeful one at family dinner. Be the one who points out something cool of their day. Be, be the dad who, who just takes the kids somewhere and goes, look, wow. Let, let's add wow back into our vocabulary. Timothy, Paul writes to him, he's a young minister, and he's gone through some things. And he warns him about a bunch of stuff, but he wraps up a concept with him like this. He says, but you, Timothy, man of God, run for your life from all this. Pursue a righteous life, a life of wonder, faith, love, steadiness, courtesy, Run hard and fast in the faith. Seize the eternal life, the life you were called to, the life you so fervently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. Paul, Paul David Tripp put it this way. He says, fear of man is an all problem. When I forget that God's glory defines not only him, but who I have become as his child, I look to people to give me meaning, purpose, and identity. Awe of God means I live knowing that there is a greater story than my little personal story. Awe of God means that there is a grander kingdom than my little kingdom of one. Awe of God means that God has a plan far bigger and better than plans I have for myself. Can I pray for us? Jesus, wow. We look back at 2023 and instead of calculating all our disappointments, our letdowns, markers we didn't, didn't hit, goals we did or didn't achieve, we open our eyes and we just say, wow, you've blessed us been gracious and kind and good to us. You've been merciful beyond anything we deserve. Wow. We want to look at you and wonder, be inspired to have the hair in our arms stand up again. Would you forgive us for how much we've minimized who you are, God? how much we've explained away how you work, who you love or don't. Would you fill us with your spirit right now in this room? Would you give us a spirit of awestruck wonder? Would you open our eyes to all the cool things you're doing around us? Could you give us that childlike faith again? We want to be surprised. We want to position ourselves this year to be surprised. Help us see it and all the things you're already doing. We want to be wowed. We commit right now, God, in this room to going into this year with that mindset, making that choice to see what might happen. We love you. We're so grateful for how good you are. I pray for everyone here, God, that you would just open their eyes to see the wonders around them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.